Welcome to another Audience Caller episode of The Real Stuff Podcast. Today's guest, I know in real life, and you will hear in the episode how the two of us met back in my New York City days. Jess is someone who I've watched change a ton over the past few years, both as a person in real life and also as a social media presence. So as you will hear in today's episode, her second daughter was born with a birth diagnosis of Down syndrome. And what I mean by that is that they found out at birth when typically you would find out from a chromosomal test that you do during pregnancy. You will hear from the episode, they did do that chromosomal test. It all came back negative for Down syndrome during the pregnancy, but her daughter did in fact have Down syndrome. And this diagnosis changed the whole course of Jess's life. She and her friend Taryn, who also has a child with Down syndrome, have now become the founders of this amazing platform called Extra Lucky Moms, which is a community for disability parents. I have really had the pleasure of having a front row seat to watching Jess transform from being this mom of one to a person who today has dedicated her entire life seemingly to Extra Lucky Moms and just to the whole cause in general of connecting people within the disability community. And Extra Lucky Moms is not just for Down syndrome parents, it is for anyone with a child that has any disability. Today's conversation was such an intimate one, and as a person myself who's now been pregnant twice, both times did the Down syndrome test, and doesn't even really even personally know myself exactly what I would do if I were to get a positive result on that chromosomal test, this conversation got very honest and very deep, and it takes us to a place that most people just don't feel comfortable going to in this realm, to talk about the possibility of terminating a Down syndrome pregnancy with someone who has a child that has Down syndrome is just a taboo topic at its finest. The whole purpose of this podcast, and I really hope that you will learn something from the way the two of us navigate this conversation together. I wanted to call out for you that I have another fun audience caller episode that I'm working on pulling together, and it's going to be all about gender disappointment. So, you know, hoping to have a boy but getting a girl, hoping to have a girl but getting a boy. This is a topic that I find so fascinating because we live in this society where when you're pregnant and you're having a baby, it's kind of just the politically correct thing to do to say, I don't care about the sex. I just want to have a healthy baby. And of course, that is what we all want at the end of the day deep down. However, Gender disappointment is a real thing, and it is something that has been talked about amongst my mom groups and communities that I'm part of, and I know the wider world feels this to some extent. So although this is an extremely taboo topic and not everyone feels comfortable opening up about gender disappointment, especially once they've had their child, and the last thing they want is that child learning that they wished the child was another sex, I would love to do a podcast episode about this and hear from people who have something to say about this topic. So if you have a particular story about gender disappointment or how it's impacted you throughout a pregnancy, please send an email over to therealstuffpod at gmail.com. Tell us your story and my team will reach out if we think you're a fit. And if you are loving the show and you leave a five-star rating and a written review on either Apple or Spotify, Please screenshot your review and send it over to me on Instagram for a personalized voice note from me as a thank you. And now let's get into today's episode with Jess Quarello. For people who don't know, Jess and I go way back back. to three apartments ago in New York City for me. It was my first apartment I lived in with Michael and we had just moved in together. It was before we were even married to each other. Jess said hi to me in the elevator. I don't know. Were you following me? Is that I how you knew me? You because at the time, I was working in corporate. And we did a lot of work with Refinery29. And I watched Living with Lucy religiously. And then one day, <laughs> she was in my elevator in my building. And I was like, oh, my God. I'm so, I was so nervous. I was like, should I say hi? I felt like you maybe knew that I lived in the building because the layout of my apartment I think you were in the same line as me or something. And it was a very unique layout of the apartment. And I think you were like, I was wondering if you lived here because (laughs) your apartment looks just like mine. It looks just like my apartment. Yeah. And I said hi to you. And then we sort of struck up this friendship. And I feel so humbled to be here because if you go back, I mean, how many years ago was that now? It must have been like- It must have been like 2016. Yes. God, we're old. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which is wild. Like almost 10 years ago. And at that time, I remember you got pregnant with your first. Yes. 
And I, not even a married girl yet, but someone who was obsessed with babies and kind of obsessed with the whole path of marriage, babies, you know, I knew I was going to be on it soon. I cannot even express the joy I felt finding out that a friend I had made in the building was having a baby and that there was going to be a baby within the vicinity. I know. Oh my God. I remember that. And And you and your sister came over. over. Yes. Any excuse, if someone gets a puppy or a baby, I'm there. (laughs) And you just provided me with that baby. And I remember I came over, I think I brought her a little blankie. You brought her a beautiful pink blanket that we still have. And it was embroidered with her name. And your sister came over and I got to meet your beautiful sister. And I, you know, postpartum was a tough time, but that was such a just a memory that is like in my mind forever. So it's sort of crazy full circle and surreal that I'm sitting on your podcast right now. So I want to hear a little bit about your first pregnancy experience and your, you know, your foray into motherhood and that postpartum, because that was back in a time before I knew anything. So I think I came over and probably pushed right past you and was like, baby. (laughs) I was fine. Because it was you, I was fine. I mean, that's like a thing that people don't really understand until after they become a parent themselves and they go through it, that those first few days, there's a lot of darkness and isolation. And when people come over and just want to see the baby and don't think about the mom and I don't know, I wish I had brought you food. I wish I had given you a gift card, like things that I would do now for a mom. But you were one of the first, (laughs) you were one of the first moms I knew. So you did so much. I didn't do that stuff, but I'm curious. Lucy, you brought me a freaking custom gift. I brought you a custom gift, but it was for the baby. I was so new on my motherhood journey. And I am the oldest of my family. I have the first grandchild. And my mom had me, you know, years and years and years ago, where the dynamic and the whole world of new motherhood was completely different. I also didn't live near family. So it was really a lot to become a mom. I loved her immediately. I was just immediately obsessed. Like this is the perfect baby. Oh my God. Like this is amazing. But I, because of that obsession, I developed postpartum anxiety and depression. And I didn't know that I was experiencing anxiety until I know, I knew like it it was all of a sudden I was sort of having trouble going outside with her I would get so much anxiety about um, an upcoming plane ride that I would have to take. This one plane ride that I was taking with her by myself. And it was like three, she's me three months old. It's the first plane ride that I was taking with her solo, which is honestly like a big deal. Like I should probably give myself. That is a huge <laughs> deal. Like now I'd be like, are you nuts? Like I'll come see you when she's six months. Um, <laughs> but I was determined. Like I was totally that mom that went for walks every day and like got myself out there. And when you're in New York City, that it's. I will say that was like a wonderful thing to be a new mom in New York City because there's so many meetups. I went on walks with new moms. I had a doula who connected me with a lot of people. But anyway, I had this one plane ride and I was so anxious about it and it would keep me up at night. And my husband at the time was like, you gotta, we gotta figure this out. Like he was really supportive. And so I started seeing a therapist and we did cognitive therapy, which was this really cool way Mm. of kind of like normalizing the anxiety but not giving it credit. So we did these like thought records, which was really fascinating where we'd write down like the worst case scenario and then the evidence to support that worst case scenario. And so by the time the flight came, I felt anxious, but I was prepared. And then of course she was a, she was an angel. Like she didn't cry. I remember this woman at the end of the flight was like, honey, she's beautiful. (laughs) you are such a lucky mom. And I was like, I know. Thank you. And I'm just thinking to myself, I wasted all this silly time, like all anxious about this stupid fight. But when, when you're a new mom, it's all you can think about. It's like all consuming. You're all of a sudden you're pregnant and then the baby's there and you have a life to take care of and you have to make sure that they stay alive and fed and you've got to pump and you got to do this. And it's like, wow, it's, it's a big transition. How old were you when you had Charlie, your first? So I had, I was, oh, that's a good question. Oh, two weeks after she was born, I turned 30. Okay. Yeah, so I was 29 technically. So I was, And then what is the age gap? So Addie is exactly almost three years um, apart from Charlie. So I do love the age gap. The difference in age is really nice, but there's also a piece of me that wishes I just knocked him out. 
<laughs> That's going to be my exact age gap is like two years and 10 months or something. You know, Charlie and Addie are slowly starting to play together, but because of Addie's disability, she's a little bit cognitively delayed. So I would say it's a little bit more time kind of cognitively between them. But Charlie has taken on more of a motherhood role and like a caregiver role with her sister. And she's very protective of her. So, so I want to talk about Down syndrome and I want to get into that diagnosis. But first I want to – uncover the language that you use when talking about Addie and when talking about Down syndrome in general. I So now I've heard you call it a disability. Do you use the word neurodivergent neuro versus neurotypical? Is that relevant in this conversation? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting that you asked that. So I'm neurodivergent. I have ADHD spectrum disorder. It makes me who I am. I can do 8,000 things at the same time. And if I'm not doing 8,000 things at the same time, I'm wanting to do something. Um, (laughs) So I like that classification myself. Um, When it comes to the disability community at large, we're always listening. We're always asking, what is the new term? Because it changes, right? Like there's always going to be shifts and and transitions. Like for the autism community, the puzzle piece was this really big thing. And now that's shifting. And so we're listening. Um, When we started Extra Lucky Moms, we called ourselves special needs moms because that's what we felt made the most sense for us. And then we were listening to the community and those with disabilities were saying, we don't feel like we're anything more special than any neurotypical individual. We like being disabled. We are disabled and we should use the actual terminology. So I look forward to one day asking Adeline what she prefers. And I'm sure, I mean, the girl cannot stop talking because she talks constantly. So I know she will be able to tell me, but I think when it comes to verbiage and classification, it really is about knowledge and and just asking people questions. For our family and for our network of community, we prefer disability. Disability is one of those things that I think it's such a frustrating rap because it's the only marginalized group that anyone could be a part of. It doesn't matter if you're black, you're brown, you're white, you're, where are you from, what your, if you're, what your poverty level is, if you're wealthy. I could, you know, knock on wood, get into a car accident and become con- cognitively disabled at any moment. And so the fact that we live in a society where disability is not completely celebrated and, you know, really supported, it, it breaks my heart. So it's been this sort of, I don't know, this hill that I'm going to die on. <laughs> I'm going to fight for my kiddo and I'm going to fight for myself. You know, I'm, I'm different and I'm disabled to a degree with my ADHD and that's there's nothing wrong with that. So I think most people are aware of the extra chromosome that leads to Down syndrome, but can you explain how the syndrome manifests? I'm sure it's different in different people, but what exactly does it mean for a person yeah. when they have Down syndrome? So there are three types of Down syndrome. There is trisomy 21 which is what Adeline has, it's most common. There's translocation, and then there's mosaicism. Um, So trisomy 21, and it all happens at conception. You can't, you don't catch Down syndrome, you can't get it from somebody else, it happens at conception. And I wish I had the actual numbers to, to show you how rare Adeline's Down syndrome diagnosis is because she went not only undetected, but she made it through the pregnancy and the percentages of you know, miscarriage is very, very high for, for children with Down syndrome. But trisomy 21 happens at conception. It's a magical thing. It's the triplification of the 21st chromosome. So we all have cells and we also have chromosomes. And Adeline has an extra one on every single one of her, her cells. So instead of 46, she's got 47. So we call it extra. She's extra lucky. Typically what you see with someone with Down syndrome is something called hypotonia which is low muscle tone. So when she came out, I remember this like big floppy baby that just came out of me. And when my oldest was born, it was like this strong willed screaming infant. So something like that could kind of give you the the differentiator between what that might look like in a child that comes out with a disability like Down syndrome. And then when it comes to intervention, um, Adeline has required extra needs. She needs occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy. We've done 
um, cognitive behavioral therapy. We've done all kinds of therapies. And, you know, I'm very lucky that we live in an area that we do. She goes to an amazing inclusive uh, preschool. She's actually in the self-contained classroom right now, which means she's with others with, with disabilities. But our hope is that with all of the intervention that she's receiving in school, she'll one day be in a completely inclusive school environment. We're working on that. But again, inclusion is not for everyone. Inclusive being inclusive is what we hope for, but not everyone is able to make that happen for their child. Um, we're fighting for that because everybody everybody wins. Everybody learns something. It's so good for the other children that aren't disabled to experience differences. But people with Down syndrome live beautiful lives. They get married. They um, live on their own. They, are, you know, Adeline had a heart surgery. She is thriving. She's like any typical child. You know, she'll be four in July and we're almost potty trained. And I remember thinking to myself, like, oh my God, I'm going to have this little girl and she's going to be in diapers forever. No, like bad at all. She's just, it's just a little bit slower pace, um, but they get there. And I think with an advocate like myself and other amazing extra lucky moms that I'm such good friends with and just find inspiration from, the more that you invest in your child and believe in them, the more capable they will become. Like I've never treated Adeline like this poor disabled child. I have led with being her mom first and her, my daughter first. And if we need to readjust our parenting because she can't do something, then we do it. But like we go to, we go to theme parks, we go out to dinner, we go on vacation. um, We go to the pool, even if it's like crazy and she's running around. Like we went through an elopement stage for a little bit. That was very stressful, but who does (laughs) it? Like everyone goes through this. It's just some of these stages are a little bit longer for us. Down syndrome is one of the most amazing things that's ever happened to our family. I think people with Down syndrome are the most magical, beautiful people in the world. Makes me want to cry. Like just being able to be her mom is the greatest gift. What she's taught me about the value of life and society. You know, when I had Adeline, a lot of my grief that I experienced was because I didn't know anybody with Down syndrome. I had met one person in my life and that person scared me. I wasn't comfortable with disability at all. And I didn't know how to interact with that person. And so I just, you know, what we fear, we, we push away. And then I was forced to face my fears. And I luckily was able to face my fears with the most loving, delicious bebe in the world. But I think if I had known how beautiful my life was going to be with Adeline, the first few years of her life would have had a lot less fear in them. Because our life is pretty typical. It's pretty normal. What I love about this podcast and kind of the line of questioning that we can get into is that really the point of it is to push past the comfortable questions and kind of get into what would be considered taboo. What's so fascinating is when you learn of a friend that has a child that has any disability and is born with anything, I don't think it would ever cross someone's mind to start asking questions about – you know, did you know beforehand? Did you choose to keep the baby? Did you do genetic testing? That kind of thing. Yeah. I think I personally think it's there's value in talking to a person who's gone through it and, you know, hearing their story and how it's all happened for them and really getting to the root of what they wish people would say or what people have said that doesn't feel good. But you do such a good job on your podcast of doing that, like asking those questions that no one really wants to ask. Thank you. And it's, I mean, I've had some really uncomfortable moments on the podcast (laughs) where I'm just not sure if it's an okay question to ask, but I always want people to correct me first and foremost if I'm asking something insensitive or explain why something might be phrased wrongly or something like that. But I understand your diagnosis with Down syndrome happened at birth. Yeah. So you it went undetected. That to me says that you did do a round of genetic testing and it came back negative. So can you explain kind yes. of what happened during the pregnancy? Yeah, it's actually really, I love that you brought this up. First of all, I love getting asked questions. That's why I got a tattoo. People are like, what's that tattoo? I'm like, well... I get to talk about my daughter, you know, or we, I wear a branded sweatshirt and says extra lucky mom. And people are like, what does that mean? I think it's so wonderful when people ask questions, it shows curiosity and it shows care. Obviously you want to be sensitive, but I never take people's questions to heart. If somebody says something like, 
oh, is that a Down syndrome baby? I would, when I was maybe younger on my journey of extra lucky caregiving, I would have gotten my feelings hurt. But then I just look at it as an opportunity to educate and say, yes, my child does have Down syndrome, but we actually don't label her. We, we appreciate her, you know, person first language. And then if that person does it again, then, then I can get offended because they know something and they've chosen not to use that knowledge. But there's so much to learn about disability. And the more you ask questions, the more you're going to figure it out. So I'm so glad you're, you know, asking me all these questions. I personally am, you know, never here to judge anybody. All I'm going to do is just share how amazing my life is and whatever you decide to do with your body. And if that is your choice, um, no judgment. And that's how we kind of lead our company. But going back to the diagnosis. Yeah. So I actually was going through a very horrible um, health scare at the time I had, um, I've had since had my surgery. I have a, a beautiful scar here. Um, but I had a double disc replacement and fusion in my upper, upper cervical spine. So when I was pregnant, I had to stop taking all my medications for the pain that I was in um, for spinal stenosis. And it was horrible. The pain was horrific. So I, not only was I getting monitored, but I was doing extra monitoring. So every single month I would get an ultrasound and nothing ever popped up. This girl was coming in hot. What about that 10 week and oh, yeah, I did that. Test. So that's another thing with her. That's why I know she's an angel because it's just crazy to me. We She passed. She passed. So just so people who have never been pregnant know, at 10 weeks, you can get a simple blood test and it's called the NIPT test, stands for non-invasive prenatal test. And it not only tells you the baby's sex, but also kind of screens for a handful of chromosomal abnormalities down syndrome being one. And it doesn't give you like a yes or no. It mostly says low risk or high risk. And at the point at which if you were to get a high risk diagnosis, then you can move further into like an amniocentesis or another test to kind of get a better picture, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, if they do an amnio and they do a test that way, they could actually detect 100% 100% certainty of certain chromosomal abnormalities yes. at that stage. Yes. So they go right okay. to take it from the actual. But when your NIPT says low risk, you kind of move past that, oh, especially yeah. at, at your age. Yeah, at my age. I mean, I was um, almost 34 when I had her. So I was 33 years old, just living my best life, eating chips and had no, <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that I was, you know, growing this extra chromosome, you know, inside me. Um but yeah, it, it's very rare what happened to me, but it's also not rare. And I have been able to connect with other moms who've experienced birth diagnoses, young moms. Um, I think there's this a lot of stigma surrounding disability that it happens to people when you're older. But I have so many young mom friends whose children have Down syndrome. So many. Um, I would say more than most are younger. Interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, my understanding of it was just the way my OB phrased it was that at as your age goes up, your risk just gets higher with each pregnancy. But, you know, obviously not that it's impossible for younger pregnant people. Yeah, absolutely. I think a big part of why I advocate so hard is because I, as an educated white woman of privilege, how I was so ignorant to this beautiful life. If I, as someone that's been exposed and traveled and had this amazing opportunity to really meet people and love people, was so small-minded about disability, then there must be more people out there like me. And I have to change that. I have become loud and proud online about disability because my mind has been changed and shifted. And everything that I thought I knew before Adeline is just completely different. This little girl has completely changed everything I know to be true and proves, you know, me right every day. When you learn about people today, whether it's friends or just a stranger on the internet who tells a story of doing the NIPT test, getting a positive or a high risk for Down syndrome, following it up, and ultimately having an abortion yeah. from it. Does that feel personal? Do you literally – like I, I can't imagine not feeling offended by that if I were in your shoes. And how – really, how do you feel when you hear that? I mean, it breaks my heart, but it also breaks my heart for the mom because I, I know that making a decision like that can only be the most heart-wrenching experience 
ever. And you also don't really know other people's circumstances. Can they take care of this child? Do they live in an area where there is schooling? Um, do they live near family? Financially, is this going to be a burden? Like there are all of these things that come into like, I think people that think that people that make a, a choice to have an abortion are just like, I don't want this baby. And I, you know, there are, I'm sure people around the world that think that, but we've heard, we have people in our community who've had an abortion and now have found our community as support. Like we, we really think of ourselves as an educational platform and we lead without judgment. Now, personally, it breaks me in half because I just know that there are so many families who would adopt, like adopt a child with Down syndrome. Like the way, like there are so many kids with Down syndrome that need homes. There would be a family in no time that would take that child. But again, that's another thing maybe that they can't carry or it's too dangerous for them. And so I'm always trying to at least lead with love on my end. I wear this bracelet every day. It's got three hearts on it as a reminder to lead with love. And, you know, I'm not here to judge that's up, if God wants to judge, that's up to God. But I, I don't believe in my journey being to judge others. But yeah, it, it breaks, it breaks my heart because my life is so much better with Addie in it. Can we talk about how you and your husband approached having a child with a disability in different ways? What happened when she was born and you guys got this diagnosis and what toll did that take, if any, on your relationship with each other? Yeah. So I experienced the birth diagnosis as a mother, postpartum, all the feels. A lot of feelings. (laughs) All the feelings. And he experienced it as the dad without the hormones and all his feels. And, you know, when you have a baby, we were so excited to have the second born because we were just like, he took a couple weeks off. We were just going to sit and snuggle with the baby and just be his like little family. Charlie would come home from school and whatever. But instead we spent hours, me on one computer, him on the other, setting up our care team for Adeline because she had so many medical complexities that came with her diagnosis. We had no- nothing prepared. We didn't, we had to get a cardiologist, an endocrinologist, and pulmonologist, like all of these doctors that you have to get. And so it was not only a grieving process of like wrapping our heads around this diagnosis, but we were grieving our new family dynamic and what was supposed to bring us together ultimately like kind of pushed us apart for that time. Um, and I don't want to speak for him because, you know, I'm, especially since I'm a woman and a man, but I will speak for myself. I ended up embracing this, I think a little bit faster. Um, because I also was the stay-at-home caregiver. Once she was born, I decided to stay home and, and focus on, on her needs 100%. But we struggled. We struggled in the beginning. You know, I, as a content creator, wanted to go live and just be like, this is my baby. She's amazing. And he was very reserved and he didn't necessarily think that we needed to announce anything, you know, and I, I said, I just really feel like we should. And then out of nowhere, October came around, which is Down Syndrome Awareness Month. And my sister actually texted me and was like, by the way, it's Down Syndrome Awareness Month. I'm sorry if you're new. <laughs> I'm like, didn't know that because we're new on this journey. <laughs> um, and my husband at the time kind of looked at me and was like, okay, like, I think I'm ready to like go live with this. And we both did like our posts, which is so silly, but it also is, it was such a beautiful experience to do that on the same day. And we had just this like crazy outpouring of love. So many people came, followers that I, you know, cause I've been on social media forever feels like i mean we're getting old we're getting old lucy but all these amazing people that had followed me forever were just by my side just you know shouting the joy alongside me and so and then you know continuing on through our marriage we've always put our kids first and i don't know i think it can it can be really difficult like i'm not gonna lie um making sure you're making time for your partner especially with a diagnosis like down syndrome because you are just you know, for those first few years, it's really, really tough. But I have some advice. I would say make sure to go on date nights. Um, make sure to prioritize your partner when you can. Checking in with them, like you said, how you wished you had brought me like some food or whatever when we met after the baby was born. Making those gestures for your partner, I think, is really important because we are and not only just with someone with a disability, like raising someone with a disability, this is for all mothers and fathers, you know, making sure that you're focusing on each other. Um But yeah, I think making sure that you're paying attention to each other's needs and and asking questions and staying communicative, it's really important. 
we all probably know that the best way to learn a new language is through immersion. So AKA move to another country and learn that way. And while I'm not exactly in the stage of life to move somewhere else right now where they don't speak English, I find that the second best way for me to learn a language is with Babbel. Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. I personally took Spanish all throughout middle school, high school, and a little bit in college. And now that Milo's nanny is from Colombia, I've been using Babbel to give me a refresher on the language. So I'm able to practice my conversation skills with her, and then we can both teach Milo how to say things in Spanish together. Hearing him say, gracias, adios, and hasta mañana to his nanny is just so sweet. Babbel is giving a special limited time deal to the Real Stuff listeners, so right now you can get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription. And it's only for our listeners at babbel.com slash Lucy Fink. So get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash Lucy Fink, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash L-U-C-I-E-F-I-N-K. Rules and restrictions may apply. So you kind of answered it there when you were talking about those first few weeks of needing to scour for all these doctors. I was curious at what point with this diagnosis – you needed to be kind of approaching parenthood differently. But it sounds like from birth, having a child with Down syndrome or any of these other disabilities kind of causes a change in what the experience of having a newborn is like. It is completely different. And and you would think that OT and PT doesn't start till they're older. No, it starts when they're two months old. Like she was in a full program by two months old and I was taking like a pen and doing, you know, eye tracing with her and it, it was a full-time job. I was very privileged that I was able to stay home and take care of my child. A lot of people don't have that luxury and they have to go right back to work and they have to rely on childcare to help them with therapies and that sort of thing. Um, but we started what's called early intervention right away. And early intervention is a program that is provided by the state from zero to three years old. So she was in early intervention up until three and now she's in the public school program. But I never worried about that with Charlie. I just was worried if she was going to have a blowout at CVS. <laughs> like, that's all I was worried about. And Addie, I was dealing with a full Rolodex of therapies. We had to go to cardiology. I mean, she had heart surgery within her first year of, of life, you know? So not only was, an, was I an extra lucky mom, I was a medical mama as well. I have so many other friends in this community who go through even much more than I went through. And it can, it can be really hard. It's really taxing. I have some PTSD from um, some of the health scares that we've had with Addie. You know, I'm not gonna not gonna sugarcoat it. There was a time where she almost passed away from cellulitis, of all things. Um, what is that? Cellulitis is a, is a skin infection. We took her to the pool, and she had a cut on her leg, and something got in it. And you know, because of her little body, her immune system isn't as strong as others, and it just attacked. And it, it was it was horrible, but. I, you know, was in a hospital room wondering, is my child going to make it kind of thing? It's scary, but it's almost like out of body. Like you just do it. You know, it's like when people are like, I don't know how she does it. I'm like, shut up. Like, of course you don't know how I do it. I don't know how I do it. I'm just doing it. Like you would do it too. <laughs> and it's not until afterwards where you have time to reflect. You're like, holy moly, that, that was nuts. And I'm so lucky wow. that she's still here. This process of you going from... Addie's born and you're confused and a little scared and not excited about it at first, for lack of a better word, to let's shout it from the rooftops. I'm an extra lucky mom. <laughs> Maybe not the stage you're at now, but even just the stage when you were ready to post about it on social media or tell everyone in your network. How long was that journey? And what do you think flipped that switch for you of, you know, fuck this, I'm not living in this state of anger about this or scaredness. Like I'm, I actually feel like this is now my life's calling and purpose to step into this message. I, you know, I, I don't really know if there was a specific time, but I do remember getting looks from people um, because with something like Down syndrome, you can tell that someone has Down syndrome. Typically they have facial characteristics um, that are similar between individuals with the same diagnosis. And it's actually a blessing because it's an easiest, it's an easier diagnosis to qualify for things like early intervention and that kind of thing. Cause you just know, but there was this, <laughs> this is like such an embarrassing story, but whatever. So I was still wrapping my head around the fact that this, you know, little delicious baby that I loved so much had Down syndrome. Um, 
when I was in the hospital and there was this woman and her name was Angel and she was our nighttime NICU nurse. And so Addie was in the NICU for about four or five days, I'd say. And I spent all of this time inspecting her. I would just be like, okay, look at her hands. Okay. No, I don't see that. I don't see the, the sandal gap. Uh, maybe it's there, you know, cause there's all these physical characteristics people with Down syndrome have that you're supposed to be looking for. And I was so obsessed with finding the Down syndrome. Like, is it there? I, I go, cause she just came out. She looked so cute. And you could kind of tell, but not really. And I just didn't want to find it. I wanted her to be typical. Just so I, I'm, I'm clear, at this point, did a doctor or someone say to you, it kind of looks like she might have this? Oh, yes. We have the worst birth story of all time. My husband actually passed out in the OR. It was so hateful the way that they they gave him the information. So I'm laying there like, you know, in my C-section garb. They take her out and this floppy baby comes out. They put her on the little incubator. And the doctor on call comes in and basically like manhandles our baby and is like, your daughter has Down syndrome. Here, here she is. Like when he met his daughter, he met her diagnosis or Down syndrome first. And he was just heading over to meet his daughter. And all of a sudden this woman was just like shouting and braiding him. And it was horrible. Um, so we advocate a lot for diagnosis delivery, um, making sure that both parents are present, understanding that unless it's you know, like she wasn't going to die from this diagnosis. Like we could have right. waited. Like this is, this was so insensitive and hateful. So we actually do a lot of talks. We go to hospitals and, and we do keynotes on, and talk about appropriate diagnosis delivery and how the parent feels and what have you. But anyway, so that all happened. It was like an out of body experience. And I didn't find out until afterwards that that had it happened. I, I was so far away. I didn't know what was going on. And I opened on the table. That's all I was focusing on. I was just like not throwing up. I just didn't want to throw up. <laughs> but fast forward, we are, you know, we've been told that she potentially has Down syndrome. We're waiting for something called the karyotype test. And that's a blood test that tells you that she does or does not happen. So I'm just spending my time looking and trying to breastfeed. It was, I never was able to breastfeed with her because of low tone, hypotonia. And um, it was late at night, one night, and I was just sort of inspecting her, loving on her and, and expecting, inspecting her at the same time. And this NICU nurse came in and, and she was this older black woman. She's just so lovely. And I uh, was just chatting with her a little bit. Um, and she said to me, what a beautiful baby. And I said, thank you. I said, do you think that she has Down syndrome? Like I was so desperate at this time. It makes me want to cry. Like I, just wish I could just hug me back then because I'd be like, just wait, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> but I said to her, I was like, do you think that she has Down syndrome? And she said, honey, I don't care if she does or she doesn't. That's your baby. Love your baby. Feed your baby. Smother that baby with all the love. She said, that's what matters. Mm, I'm going to cry. Yeah. And it was that moment of like, what the hell? Like inspecting this child for a diagnosis. This is a life. This is a person. This is my person that I made that I believe God has gifted and she should never have made it through. She went completely undetected. And I had so many health issues. Like this little miracle is here. And that is really when it started. And I know it's early, but it was like, a, her name was Angel. Like, <laughs> like, you know, like, is she actually an angel? <laughs> That's what I, I think was she was. was it, like, did I make this up in my head? And this woman just told me what I needed to hear in that moment. And that's what shifted. I and, mean, you know, my husband wasn't there for that. And so it took him a little bit longer to get his head around and wrapped around it. But that, that moment really for me changed everything. And it made me realize like, you got, like, you got to stop. Like, this is your child first. You can handle this. And then everything else sort of fell into place. You know, I met Taryn and advocacy was now my new job. I was just going around town, like talking about my girl. And I don't know. I just, I made the choice. You know, I've always been a happy person and I do believe that happiness is a choice. Sometimes it's harder to, to make the choice to be happy, but we can if we try. And people with Down syndrome bring a lot of happiness. You know, she was the easiest baby ever. She sleep trained herself. She was sleeping through the night by five weeks old. She wow. I'm never, so jealous of that. I know, I know. <laughs> like never cried. She still to this day, like sleeps like a, like a champ, mm. just easy to be with happy, just a love, just a love. 
Wow. I, I think to this day, I still don't know if I've actually broken a tear on this podcast until just now. Oh my God, seriously? <laughs> I mean, I've like, I've maybe started welling up. Some of the stories have been emotional, but I have, I was just really, that was, that was a lot for me, Jess. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I hope in a good way. I didn't mean to make a No, in a, <laughs> like, so beautiful. And just what that woman said, what angel, that angel said yeah. is truly it's like what the core of every mom knows but in the moment we're filled with so much anxiety and fear that I can imagine myself in the exact same way asking a nurse do you think this and you know really being calmed by someone who approaches it that way because at the end of the day that is like it's life this is a human this is a person and especially with the diagnosis like down syndrome where it's not a life-threatening diagnosis and it's just a difference in the person and it's all about how we, especially the ones who love her most show up and embrace her. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, that's really, that made me cry. Yeah. Well, you're also about to have another one and I know I, if I could, like, I can't have any more kids. If I could, I'd be like, just give them all to me. I love babies. <laughs> we love babies. Like, but yeah, it's, it's about the person, person first and diagnosis second. Yeah. Like I am not, the, even the way that I look, is not who I am. It's the least exciting thing about me. Who I am is what's inside and the, what I, what I give back to the world and who I love and how I love. And Addie has really helped me see that. So once it was confirmed with that blood test that she did in fact have Down syndrome, how did you approach sharing that with your families and specifically with with Charlie. Oh God. How did you sort of set that up to her and let her know, you know, what to expect about her younger sister? That was the hardest part, I think, of the whole thing. You know, I had imagined this beautiful, perfect sister relationship, just like I have with my sister. My sister's my like best friend, very similar to you and yours, just twin flames for sure. And so I had made this whole thing up in my head that they would be best friends, just like me and my sister, and everything would be perfect. And so when Addie was born, I felt such guilt that I hadn't given my older daughter the sister that I had always wanted her to have, which is so ignorant and silly, but it's just the truth. I, she was only three years old at the time, but I was obsessed. I'm like, how am I going to tell her? You know, how am I going to tell this three-year-old? Luckily, was in therapy very soon after. I mean, I've always been in therapy. I love therapy. But um, we would go to, to group therapy, or excuse me, we would go to couples therapy, my husband and I. And then I would do individual. And I kept bringing this up. And she's like, Jessica, she is three years old. She doesn't know what Down syndrome is. And you can just start talking about it. Just make it normal. And so instead of sitting her down, like this big dramatical thing, we decided to just talk about Down syndrome and talk about and, and have her be exposed to the therapies and have her, you know, be a part of physical therapy because everything was in the home. And it just became a part of her sister's thing that she does. And now Charlie, like, will go into a CVS and she'll be like, mom, look. And I'll look over and it's a little girl with Down syndrome and like the makeup aisle and then add. You know, and she's like, look at that. It's just like Addie. Like she, she, she knows that her sister's different, but I don't necessarily know if there was ever a time that it, it clicked because it's always just been what we talk about. And she was so young. Um, and that is, that's a privilege. There's a lot of people whose children are older and maybe it's a bigger deal, but for us just normalizing it from the get go was really important because we never wanted her to feel less special than Addie, especially because Addie was getting so much more attention because she was the new baby, but also because she had extra needs, you know? A lot of times you hear about parents saying that once the second baby comes, they feel a little sense of guilt over not being able to provide as much attention to their older one. And that's kind of – a lot of people have warned me that that was like the hardest thing for them. And that must be amplified times 100 when the baby that's coming in has higher needs that you need to attend to. And it's, you know, as you were saying, the biggest thing you're concerned about is not the CVS blowout. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot more. Did that ever make you feel mom guilt towards Charlie? Yes. I still feel mom guilt towards Charlie. You know, I am very conscious of the fact that Adeline does require extra needs. And I do what I can to make sure I'm spending one-on-one -on -one time with both daughters. That has been challenging, but it's also really important. And it's, it's not something that I'm willing to not do. We talked about this a little bit when I was a guest on your podcast, which... 
Extra Lucky Moms podcast plug yeah. for anyone who hasn't listened. And I asked you this question and I'm going to ask it again because it feels fitting. When you follow a mom on social media like me or if you're just talking to a mom friend who has kids who don't have any disabilities and you catch wind of them complaining about something that's stressing them out in their life or something that their child is doing that's bugging them or that a rough patch they're working through. Are you ever just like, oh, shut up. You don't even know what I have to go through. Like you don't – you are just – you don't even know how easy you have it, that kind of thing. Yes. I mean, I'm – well, no. I, I – yes and no. I think – on my bad days where I'm getting fed up, where I'm like, why the heck do I have to deal with all this? If you caught me on a day like that and you maybe had the audacity to not be self-aware enough to like not complain about the easiest shit ever, yes. But I luckily am surrounded by people that are very self-aware and know that they can come to me and say that something's really bothering them. And honestly, sometimes it's nice to have a reprieve from the stress of being a disability parent. Like, I love to hear about other people's problems. It's, it's easier for me to deal with mine because it's all relative. It's like everybody goes through their own thing. Everyone has their trouble and it's all relative. And when I was a new mom to a neurotypical child, I had worse postpartum anxiety and I didn't have a child with disability. So mm-hmm. for us to judge others and where they're going through, I think is unfair. I really think that it's important to recognize that everyone is going through their shit. And I, especially with my friends and my women friends, the ones that I call when I need help, they are there for me because even if something is seemingly insignificant in comparison to maybe a medical diagnosis or a hospitalization, it's still important to that person. And I want to make sure to hold space for them when I can. I try. A lovely answer. It, it just goes back to the yes and. Like, yeah. it's both. Yeah. It could be both. We love dialectics over at uh, Extra Lucky Moms. In my book, um, what we wrote called Dear Mama, Stories of an Extra Lucky Life. Um, It's a compilation of 28 letters from moms in the community, writing a letter to a new mom on her journey. And they all start, dear mama. But I talk about this thing called the and, and I I called it the and concept where two completely different experiences and feelings can coexist at the same time. And that really is motherhood. It's not just being a disability parent. I love my child and they're driving me crazy. That happens all the time. It doesn't mean you don't love your child. It means they're just driving you crazy right now and you love them. And if they, you didn't love them, they probably wouldn't be bothering you so much. You know, I actually just had a guest on the show. The whole podcast was about her choice to live a child free life and she's in her forties. And I think I said something to her like, yes, I love being a mom. I love my child, future children. And I love the life path I've chosen. And I'm a little jealous of you. Yes, I was just going to say. Choosing to have no kids and just getting to do whatever you want. Yeah. Well, my husband and I had decided that if we couldn't have kids naturally, we probably wouldn't adopt and we would just have like a fabulous shoe collection and handbags and we'd travel (laughs) everywhere. And like, that sounds amazing, but nothing compares to motherhood. You know, I, I, but then there's also part of me that's like, go you girl, like to know that that's not for you. It's not your journey. I think that's really empowering and beautiful. I want to get into just at the end here, a little bit about your recent decision to not show your children on social media, which stuck out to me immediately because I'm so used to clicking into your stories and seeing the girls. And one day I tapped in and there were these cute little heart emojis over their faces. And I was wondering if you're comfortable opening up about why you made that choice right now. Yeah, it was a difficult choice. And I will say I'm kind of like toying with how it makes me feel every day because there's a piece of me that misses sharing their little faces with all my amazing community. But it got to the place where I was starting to get like recognized at the mall. People online started to just ask very invasive questions, um, would notice where we were. And my oldest, Charlie, is going to be, as I said, seven. And she doesn't like the camera. Like she just doesn't like it. Mm. And I was noticing her kind of like not... And I was like, what am I doing? You know, like, the, no, that, that's not happening. Um, and then I thought if I'm not going to show Charlie, then I probably need to not show Addie. It just got to the place where it was too much and people were getting to be so nosy. And then one of my ads, I, I was the Huggies brand ambassador this past year through March. 
And one of our ads got stolen and put um, into another etherverse and my children's likeness was all over the place. And that really opened up my eyes to making sure that like something as secure as Walmart and Huggies, that it could happen like that really oh, made wow. me nervous. So it really is just to, to protect them. You know, I think I actually took um, 30 or 40 days off of social media. I just turned my phone off basically and took time off because it got to the place where it was just all consuming. You know, when you, you know how it is, it's like your work is online. It's hard to differentiate life from online. <laughs> um, so I think I just wanted to see how it felt and take a break and the, you know, my community hates it. So <laughs> we'll see, but it really was just to be protective. And I think if I ever do show them again, it's going to be in a way that is, you know, very curated and very, um, after the fact, like no real time stuff. Um, we've had experiences where we've, I've posted something and then someone would show up and that just, it just yeah, it just makes you nervous. Makes me a little nervous yeah. to, to do that. I mean, and it's at the end of the day, your community's opinion on it is irrelevant because it's really just about what you think feels yeah. right in the moment and also judging your kid's character and seeing, you know, you know what they don't like. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a fascinating conversation. And I mean, at the stage I'm at, Michael and I decided very early on that we weren't intentionally hiding Milo's face. You know, I, I didn't ever put an emoji over him. But I do remember saying very early on that, I mean, there was no risk of us becoming a family vlog channel because <laughs> <laughs> Michael is very uninterested. So I, we weren't going to become like, you know, those yeah. channels where you go to and it's like always the full family. But I was very insistent on not wanting someone to go to my Instagram page, for example, and have, I guess the way I described it was like, I don't want a majority of the squares popping out to just be his face, like front and center. Yeah. It's it means less to me if he's in the content. If you know, a lot of the content I create, I intentionally capture him from the back just to sort of limit how much of it. And also, I still want my platforms to be about me. Yeah. So I don't want it to become like the Milo show. Yeah. Now having a second, I feel the same way right now. And you know, Milo has shown us that he has like an outgoing personality yes, and he actually so does like the camera unfortunately <laughs> to the point where you know as soon as we take a picture he's like I want to see it yeah. like, wants, it's just, just like me when I was little but I have no idea how our daughter's going to be with it and I also from the start we were doing what you just said of never posting live where we are when we go on vacations I would never tag the hotel or say where we're staying until we've left um, and same thing with restaurants or, I don't know, even just everyday life. That said, I could see a time in the future, and for no specific reason at all, I could just see a time as my kids are getting older and as they're kind of going off into like their own individual lives that I just make the decision to stop showing them. Yeah. But not in a way necessarily that is like telling my family and – anyone in my circle that like they're not allowed to post them right. and trying to keep it a, a big secret, but just being like, you know, I'm just not going to do that anymore on my big platform with 500,000 TikTok followers. Yeah. You can't – it's one of those things that I think I always thought I would be the kind of mom that was hiding them and not showing them. And then when he was born, I had a conversation with Michael and our decision changed in the moment. And luckily, this is one of those topics you can just – keep changing your mind on. Well, and I think that that's the, the key keynote. It's you can change your mind. And I think online people get this opinion of you that you owe them something. And, mm -hmm. you know, if I worked a nine to five corporate job, I wouldn't owe my boss anything. You know, I work for you. I, you know, I, and, and I don't work for my community. My community, I work together. I, I think of it as, as a unit. And so if I'm saying to you guys, this is not good for my kids, this is not good for my mental health to be online so much, I would hope that my community would support that decision instead of judge it. And there have been some judgments and that's been difficult, but I just say, you know, just follow somebody else. Like I'm not here for you. I'm, I am a platform myself. And there was a time where you would go to my grid and it'd be a lot of kids because that's my life. I am a mother, but I really was reflective. And I said to myself, what about me? Like, I'm the reason I'm the voice. This is, this needs to be, I'm a mother and I'm growing as a mother too. And 
it's easier to share your kids when they're little because you're in the weeds and it's fun. And but then they get like a personality and an opinion, and you're like, oh, <laughs> this is not as easy. <laughs> But I think that just being open-minded to, to transitioning in or out of the spotlight is really important. And so what's going on with you now in terms of content creation? Are you working with brands and yeah. doing partnerships as Jess yes. on your own? Yes. And that's been kind of a fun little transition out of you know not being so motherhood focused. But I'm open to all collaborations. I am very sneaky with how I can have a little hand in here or the back of the head or this or that. Um, you know, just being kind of coordinating, getting that shot. But I'm really focusing on Extra Lucky Moms. And we are we are winning the NDSC award this year for social media impact, which is really cool. Um, focusing on doing our keynote speaking and really trying to make change in sort of what we have to say. Um, we have a, another book coming out this year. And then on the personal side of things, I'm always working on my music. And I can't really say my, much about that, but it's coming. You guys need to go to Jess's socials and find the singing content because <laughs> you are Celine Dion in another body. Like, I don't even know how to describe it. Your voice is unreal. That is the best compliment I've ever received. <laughs> ever. <laughs> Uh, no, I love to sing. I need to make more singing content. I do a lot more of it on TikTok. Like for me, my followers on TikTok are just like more fun. It's just a funner platform for me. Instagram seems like very serious. And I think it just depends on who you've curated on each platform, but I need to start singing more. I need to. It's so interesting how different creators have different takes on the different platforms because from my standpoint, Instagram is such a real community of people. Like I see recurring commenters and I yeah. talk to people in the DMs and TikTok. I'm just like, who found this video? <laughs> like where, where did this video go? And I mean, so, there are some people I recognize there, but it, it feels so random to me. So yeah. I'm happy to hear that someone finds TikTok to be a community. I, yeah, that's really where I started. Like I was just bored during COVID and I just started sharing on TikTok. I like – YouTube. I mean, I've been to YouTube Academy. Everything I know how to do is YouTube, um, including Refinery 29's Living with Lucy. I learned how to eat pizza in New York City. Um, <laughs> no, but TikTok can be like a really fun, wonderful community. Well, I know you kind of just said it, but you did use an acronym. So I want to plug it out so people know what you're talking about. Jess recently won the National Social Media Award that was awarded by the National Down Syndrome Congress. And Basically, this is a plug for all of you guys to go follow Extra Lucky Moms because they're just doing such a good job at using social media as a platform to connect with the Down syndrome community and just create a better and more understanding and more inclusive world yeah. so that people with Down syndrome and other disabilities feel included and feel like things are for them too as Addie should feel and as everyone with disabilities everywhere should feel. There's silos for everything, right? There's like – the Down syndrome disability support networks, then there's autism, and then there's mental health. And it's like, why? We're all doing the same thing. We're all running to appointments. We're running around for ourselves. We are trying to balance life. We're going through a mental health crisis because of what our children are, are experiencing. We're in, in and out of, we're medical moments. We're doing like, and at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we're all trying to just hold space for one another. And the, the more space we hold, the better of a community we can be in a better world. We will be too. Can you leave us with what you would say to a mom out there or a dad out there who just had a child and maybe there's something unexpected that happens, not necessarily Down syndrome, not necessarily a disability, but just the unexpected. What do you have to say? I think I would say congratulations on your beautiful baby. And then I would just say, you've got this. Because at the end of the day, they do. I remember being so overwhelmed, so overwhelmed. And then now it's a blip in time. So I would just share with them that no matter what they're feeling, they should feel it, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, feel it because one day you won't feel it and it, it'll be a good thing that you don't feel that anymore and you'll feel that shift inside of you. But we love to just say that you've got this and that if you need us, come to Extra Lucky Moms. We will find you support. We connect everyone. So if you come to us and you have a disability diagnosis of a rare disease, we find you your community. Everybody has a place in our community and there's never been one person not one single person that hasn't been connected with somebody else 
on our platform. And we're really proud of that statistic. I'm sure so many people are going to listen to this and whether or not the topic is relevant to their life are just going to feel so pleased that, you know, it's it's one of those things that hearing about it and learning about it, it's like you said in the beginning, we just need to be listening yeah. and talking to people. And so I, I think people are going to find this extremely enlightening. Everyone's going to love you because how can you not fall in love with Jessica? <laughs> oh, I love you, Lucy. I love you. You're so sweet. Thank you for having me. I just adore you. I'm so excited for all that's to come for your beautiful life. Thank you. Send all of our love to the girls. I will. Absolutely will. Thank you so much for tuning in to The Real Stuff. I'm Lucy Fink. Don't forget to follow the show on social media at The Real Stuff Pod. And if you're liking these episodes, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It helps the show so much. And if you're feeling called to come on the show, visit lucyfink.com slash apply and tell us your story. We'll see you next week for another intimate conversation on The Real Stuff.